So I want to introduce Hannah to you. She's the general manager of Jolo Vineyard and Winery uh, out in Pilot Mountain. And if you haven't been out there, it, it is a, a beautiful facility. I mean, it's like Napa Valley in North Carolina. When you're sitting in that tasting room and you look out and see Pilot Mountain up in the background, it's a beautiful location. A nice little intimate restaurant they have there as well, doing Papa style dining. Uh, so I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, and I will mention also, 2016, they were awarded the, uh, the Gold Medal North Carolina Winery of the Year, which is a, a nice feat. Uh, I think last night, uh, tasting some of their reds kind of showed you the quality of wine that they produce. Uh, and today as well, some of the wines that they've chosen to uh, prepare with the meal, I think, are just going to go beautifully. Um, like a spoiler alert, the second wine is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, my name's Daniel. I'm the manager of the dining room here. I'm also the sommelier. I'm if I can help with anything while you're here, if you have any questions, I'll do whatever I can to answer it for you. But uh, please join me in welcoming Ms. Hannah Street. Hi, everyone. So I'm Hannah from Jello, as Mr. Daniel mentioned. Um, just to let you know a little bit about our winery, kind of set the scene for what you're going to be trying this evening or this lunch time. Um, whenever we first opened up, our owners, JLB and Kristen Ray, they sought to create a standard in North Carolina not only to create wine that appeals to the palate, but also to create a standard in North Carolina for winemaking and for hospitality industry. And so I hope today the wines represent that to the best of its ability. The first wine that you're going to be trying today is actually our Jolo Pink. Um, this is a rosé that is sought after in like Provence and is a French style rosé. So the method that we use with this rosé is we harvest the grapes about two to three weeks early. So it is an unripened thought of grape. Um, you're going to get those nice unripened flavors on the palate, but off the nose it's going to give you more of like a raspberry, cherry, cranberry, uh, notes of strawberry, but think of those more in an unripened stature. Um, also going to get those on the palate with a very crisp, lip-smacking finish to it, um, nice, well-balanced tannins to it. Um, it is stainless steel aged 100%. Uh, this one, it does what is called a cold soak, which is where you are noticing that beautiful pink color that it has, which is quite bright for <coughs> those rosés that you're used to. Um, this one, it sits in a cold soak for 24 to 48 hours, and that's where that beautiful color comes from. And so we feel that it's going to pair excellent with the first course that Chef Rara has prepared for you guys. And so I'll be up shortly to talk about the second wine that Mr. Daniel was speaking of, and so I hope you enjoy.
taking things very, very seriously. Because for me, to put a real clear definition, we hear up the phrases all the time. It's farm to table, it's locally sourced, it's a locally sourced, locally driven restaurant. I hear all those catchphrases. But for me, there's never been a real clear definition on what local is and what farm to table is. So when I opened Heirloom three and a half years ago, we said, we want to put a real clear definition on what local means to me. And what local means to me is supporting my community, supporting all the people that we have these fantastic relationships with. One of my good friends, Chef Kyle McKnight, always says, buy food from friends. And if you buy food from friends, all your food will taste better. So that's what we try to employ at the restaurant any time we possibly can. So what I said first is we work with a lot of wild ingredients at the restaurant. That's what we're going to talk about today. So the soup that you're getting ready to try for your first course, we're going to make that from scratch right now. So you see absolutely how easy it is to make. We're also going to make the brine that you're going to be having. The fish that we're doing today is golden tile fish, came right off the North Carolina coast. Um, I talk a lot about sustainable fish and a lot about sustainable meat at the restaurant as well. Golden tile fish is a fish that's incredibly sustainable, but it's sustainable right now. We hear about sustainable fish and sustainable fish is this and sustainable fish is that. And what's important to understand is, while golden tile fish is a very sustainable fish right now, if every restaurant in the world started serving golden tile fish, it becomes unsustainable. The same way tuna is unsustainable at this moment. So what we have to do is understand a few chefs can work with golden tile fish, a few chefs can work with flounder, a few chefs can work with bluefish, but we can't all serve the same thing because then it becomes unsustainable in the very definition of it. So at this moment in time, golden tile fish is perfectly in season, really sustainable fish, and it works really well with the preparation that we're doing today. So a lot of people, I think, you hear about brine chicken, or brine pork chops, or marinated steak, but people never brine fish. And the worst thing that can possibly happen to a fish is it can get dry, right? If you overcook fish, it gets dry. That's exactly what happens. So what we do with fish at the restaurant and fish that can stand up to this technique is brine a lot of our fish. So we put these ingredients and these flavors in the brine, and then that soaks up into the fish. And then even if we were to overcook the fish, I like to serve my fish medium to medium well. But even if it's overcooked, it will still stay nice and moist and juicy and tender and absolutely fantastic. But the real benefit of this is the flavors that you can add to it. So we're here at Pinehurst, and I thought, what better place to cook with pine? So we cook with a lot of pine at the restaurant. There is five times the amount of vitamin C in one cup of pine needle tea as opposed to one cup of orange juice. So we should all be drinking pine needle tea. Is what we're doing today. But, um, so there's two kinds of pines that I've found here on the property. You've got the loblolly pine, which is, uh, they produce the pine cones like this. This is an unripe pine cone. And then this is one of the um, very ripe pine, lob -lob -lob pine cones. So we're going to work with these as well as we're going to work with these needles. These came off the lob lolly pine. One of the, uh, I think she said she came to the dinner last night. She might even be here. I don't recognize her. But um, one of the neighbors right across the street, they were letting me pick pine needles out of the tree. Oh, yeah. So because <laughs> I, I walked all around the different neighborhoods and I was like, all these pine trees are so nicely manicured. But the problem is, all the pine trees are so tall now that I can't actually pick the pine needles out of them. So I found one person with a pine needle that I could pick low enough. So we were out this morning foraging and picking all of these. So fantastic ingredients here. We're going to start on the soup first. So I'm going to get this cooked, and then we'll put that brine together. So I've just got a little bit of butter in here to start. I start all my soups the same way. I start with shallots or any sort of allium, where it, whether it's a white onion, red onion, shallot. It gives it a nice body to the soup, and it gives it a nice balance of flavor. The knife that I'm working with today, a little plug for him, is Steve Watkins, Iron Man Forge. If you went to the demos earlier, Steve made this knife for me about two and a half years ago. It's one of my favorite knives to work with at the restaurant, although I don't work with it as often as I should because it's too pretty to work with. <laughs> it's just one of the prettiest knives. And Steve's a sharp knife, so I'll probably cut myself during this demo. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're just going to do a really rustic cut on these onions. It's getting pureed, so it really doesn't matter what they look like. The most important thing about any of your cuts that you do for soup is that they need to be uniform in size. It makes sense because if you're going to cut something, I don't want one piece like this and one piece like this because this is going to cook way faster than this. And that's the most important thing when it comes to soup, is that everything is uniform in size. So, just a little bit of sliced shallots right here. This is going to go in first. What we're doing right now is called sweating. We're basically taking an ingredient and using heat to pull the moisture out of the ingredient, which is very similar to if we were sweating. <laughs> You're using heat to pull the moisture out. So those are going to be starting to get soft. 
okay? A little bit of garlic now. This is going to go in. I'm going to reserve a little bit of garlic for our brine later. Just the whole cloves go in there. It's perfectly fine. And if anybody has any questions as we go throughout this, please just shout out your questions. I'm more than happy to chat. I can, I can chat. I can cook. I can multitask. <laughs> Shallots and garlic in here. And as soon as these start to turn translucent, we'll start to add our other ingredients. So I'm going to let this cook while we talk about our other ingredients right now. I've just got some peeled potatoes right now. These are just a thickener for the soup. So you can thicken with rice, you can thicken with potatoes, um, you can thicken with barley, you can thicken with oats. Any sort of starch that's really going to bind the soup together. So, am I doing okay? <laughs> so, right here. These are called, um, I call them catfish greens, because all of the people who taught me how to forage, that was what they called these, was catfish greens. The Latin name is Smilax. They're also called green briars, or cat briars, or saw briars. They have lots of names. But you see the growth. I picked these literally right behind the kitchen this morning. Like, they just, they're growing everywhere right now. And I'll try to find one here as we put these into the soup in a little bit. But one that I picked this one, here it is. This is the biggest Smilax cat briar that I have ever seen in my entire life. I don't know what it is about the soil here or what, but this looks like a stalk of asparagus. And they taste very similar to asparagus. Um, you can grill them, you can saute them. They work really well in soup, obviously. Um, but they have this really nice, grassy, clean flavor. To me, it's one of those first flavors of spring. You get morel mushrooms, you get asparagus, and you get Smilax or green briar sticks. So, it's got that sauce in there. I'm going to add my potatoes in. And those are just peeled potatoes. I'm telling everybody, they have a potato peeler here. It is the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> I've been in some awesome restaurants in my time, but they have a potato peeler in the back. And it's the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> I, I sort of allocated about 45 minutes last night. I was like, oh, I have to peel potatoes for the dinner tomorrow night or for this lunch today. And I was like, that's going to take me about 45 minutes to peel all those potatoes. And I said to one of the chefs, can I borrow a peeler? We need a peeler. I'm, like, oh, I'm just going to peel some potatoes. She's like, oh, we have a potato peeler. We go back there, we put them in there, and it's, peel. it's, it's the most amazing thing in the world. <laughs> My grandfather taught me how to forage. Um, we would go out fishing. I was probably six or seven or eight at the time. We would be fishing, and we would get bored of fishing. The fish weren't biting. He said, oh, you want to go forage ginseng? Ginseng was his favorite thing in the world to forage. And at that time, there was still a lot of ginseng. We're talking 20, 23 years ago. So there was still a lot of ginseng to forage at that time. Now, if I wanted to forage ginseng, I wouldn't even know where to go. It's been foraged as close to extinction as it possibly can be. Um, and a lot of the other forage ingredients that are not forage sustainably are going that same way. So anytime I talk about foraging, I try to talk about sustainable foraging as much as we possibly can. So if you're foraging a root ingredient, um, ramps are the perfect example for this. Um, and I've written a lot of blog posts on this, and I've done a lot of interviews on this. But um, ramps are one of those ingredients. They're very trendy right now. You see a lot of different chefs working with them. The problem for me is chefs out on the West Coast, out in California, in the Pacific Northwest, are buying hundreds and hundreds of pounds of ramps. And they're going out to those restaurants, and those are not a native ingredient for the West Coast. They're a native ingredient that here in Appalachia. I don't work with artichokes. I don't think they should work with ramps. Um, <laughs> it's just one of those things. Like, I think it's, it's our ingredient. I think it should be highlighted here, and I think we treat it with respect, and we treat it with a very sustainable model. We did a video on ramps that's going to be coming out sometime this year about how to forage ramps sustainably. But you basically go down under and cut and leave the roots intact and the ramps will grow back that next year from the roots that left intact. And you get everything, you get all the benefits that you get the nice greens, you get the bulb, you get every little bit of the ramp, but you don't have to forage everything to go with it. I was up in New York about, what was that, two weeks or so ago for dinner at the James Beard House, and I was at uh, the, uh, the big farmer's market they have, I forget the name of it, but there's a big farmer's market there, and there were tables full of ramps with the roots still intact. And it made me so, so sad, because we were talking hundreds and hundreds of pounds of ramps, with the roots still intact. And it really will only be a matter, I think if it keeps going the way it's going, ramps will be extinct in my lifetime, which is the most sad thing that I could possibly think about. So we're trying as much as we can to educate other chefs, educate foragers, let people know there's right ways and there's wrong ways to forage these ingredients. And so as much as I love to forage, I would rather forage something in a small amount 
and have it there for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, rather than forage whole fields of it and then it's not there two or three years from now. So it's very important to think about that when it comes to sustainable. But you see that with how did I get into foraging? And my grandfather really taught me how to forage when I was living in DC um, eight years or so ago. And I started foraging for restaurants. I was working for Clyde's restaurant group at the time. And I just started foraging for other restaurants and getting out. And so I forage for a few of the fine dining restaurants in the area. And then just the more and more I learned, the more I could realize there's a whole pantry that opens up for wild chefs. Because who would think to cook with pine cones? Who would think to cook with smilax? Who would think to cook with wood soil? It just opens up this huge pantry of ingredients. So we'll go ahead and get this smilax in here now. So we're just going to add this right into the pot. And you can do this with any wild green. The soup that we made today has some nettles in it as well. Um, you often hear them called stinging nettles because if you get in touch with them in the wild, they will definitely sting you. So we wear two or three pairs of gloves when we're processing them and blanch them off. And then that sort of eradicates the stinger on there. It's starting to get wetted down now. This is wood soil. Um, you probably all see it in your yards and think of it as a weed. It is absolutely delicious. It has these little yellow flowers that come onto it, and it has these little seed pods that are the absolute best part of it. Right? Probably not doing it really well. If you want to see what they look like, I'm going to put them right here. So those are the absolute best part of it. They're crunchy. They're sour. It's fantastic texture, fantastic flavor. And when I want to balance the flavor in this soup, this soup can be very rich. It can be very grassy. But you really need that acidic pop from it. And we don't work with a lot of lemons at the restaurant because there's a very small lemon crop in North Carolina. There is a lemon crop in North Carolina, but maybe only 100 lemons a year. So we, we're very specific about what we do with our lemons. So to balance the acidity from this, we'll add something like wood soil that adds natural acidity to it. If you were to eat this, um, I'm going to take a little bit out of it. We'll leave it right here. If anybody wants to come up and snack on this later <laughs> and know what it actually tastes like, I encourage you to do so because, yeah. So it's all spelled the same, S-O-R-R-E-L. Um, and you hear red vein sorrel, there's French sorrel, there's variegated sorrel. Um, there's a lot of different kinds, but this is wood sorrel, and it's the only wild variety that I know of. And they all have that very similar flavor of salad. So we're going to go ahead and add that in. You can tell this is a very complicated sweet of rice. everybody to make your own stock at home. I know they sell it at the grocery store. I sell it at my restaurant, but it's so easy to make. Um, if you have any sorts of bones, you can make it with bones. Just put them on the stove, add some vegetable trim to it. I save all my carrot peelings. I save all my onion peelings. I save all my garlic trim. Any sort of vegetable trim whatsoever, I'll save that. We'll put it with the bones, and we'll just turn it on, bring it up to a simmer. If it's a vegetable, I'll let it simmer for about two hours, three hours or so, and then strain that off. If it's a fish or any sort of seafood, I'll let that go for maybe three to four hours. If it's a anything with wings, anything that doesn't walk on four legs, I'll let that go for anywhere from eight to ten hours. And if it's anything that walks on four legs, pigs, cows, lamb, anything like that, we let that go for about 24 hours. Um, so the more and more you cook it, the more flavor you get out of it. But you don't want to cook fish stock very long, it starts to get bitter. Same thing with vegetable stock. The longer you cook those stock, they get very bitter. Just gonna add our vegetable stock in right now. And we'll let that cook. <laughs> and you can see, what it's done right there is called deglazing. So the bottom of that pan has gotten sort of the, the crusty bits of us cooking right there, and it sort of browned the bottom of the pan. When we added that vegetable stock in there, it loosened up everything on the bottom of the pan, which is called fond, F-O-N-D, and that removes everything, and that balances the soup flavor. It gets every sort of that caramelization in there. That all balances the soup flavor. 
So we'll just let that cook now until the potatoes are tender and the vegetables are tender. And as soon as they're tender, we'll puree it up in that blender and it'll hopefully not make a huge mess. Uh, so. All right. Brine for the fish. This is a very simple process as well, and it utilizes pine cones. Pine cones are one of my favorite ingredients to work with. We talked about the nutritional benefits of them, but the flavor benefit is a benefit as well. So you get this nice sour flavor that comes from the pine cones. It, when we talk about vitamin C, it does have those citrusy notes in there with that. So this to me, it tastes just like lemon lime. Like you put it in there, and what goes better with fish than that sort of lemon lime, those citrusy flavors? They work really well with fish, so it's natural for me to want to put pine with fish. I don't know if that's a natural cooking thing, but it not seems natural. <laughs> the younger the pine cones, the more the flavor. Um, if I was going to say it would take maybe 10 of these to equal one of these. Um, these also have an incredible amount of natural yeast in them. I don't know if anybody makes their own sauerkraut or kimchi or kombucha or anything like that at home. But if you want to kickstart that, pick a pine cone, drop it in there. There's so much wild yeast on this that it will jumpstart your fermentation. It'll Basically, we've added this to kombucha and different things like that before we've added it to vinegars that we make. And something that would take us 10 or 12 days to get from start to finish, we can finish it in three or four days with a pine cone. So, how about beer? I've never tried it with beer. I've done a lot of porridge beers. We did mostly mushrooms last year. But I would imagine this would work really, really well. The only problem with this is a lot of beers, you like to have a very specific strain of yeast in your beer because your, that strain of yeast gives you the flavor to go with the beer. And what I've found in the past is whenever you add things with wild yeast on them to beer, sometimes you get an unintentional goza or an unintentional sour beer just because of all the wild yeast. I've done a quick rinse on them, but there's so much yeast actually in there, like in throughout the pine cone. Um, and you see the sap on it, it's already starting to ooze out where I've broken it back in the kitchen. Um, I think most of the staff that doesn't know who I am thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> I, I've been out wandering the grounds, I'm like standing up on linen baskets, like picking things out of the trees. Like, I'm sure the security guards think I'm crazy. <laughs> so, we're just going to add water to our pot right here. Really simple process to put together a brine. And this is just filtered water. No, it's pretty much straight out of my head. Most of my recipes are straight out of my head. Um, so I'm in the process of writing a cookbook, and I've never done anything that's more difficult in my life because for me, all the recipes are up here, and it's like, oh, just do this and just do that. And for a cookbook, they need to be very regimented recipes, and they need to be tested over and over. And nothing to me feels more unnatural. So <laughs> I'm getting better about it. So a little bit of chili pepper flakes here. I like a little bit of heat with a lot of my fish dishes. garlic, a fair amount of salt, and we're going to taste this. <laughs> fair amount. Like, salt works through osmosis, so that's exactly what we're trying to do, is we're trying to take the flavors that we've got right here and impart them into our fish. So. If I was just to take fish and put it in water with no salt in it whatsoever, it wouldn't pick up as many of those flavors. It would pick up some of the flavors, but it would be very faint and very, very mild. Whereas if I add the salt to this, the more salt I add, obviously the more osmosis I have, it pulls more of those flavors into the fish. But the problem is I can only leave the fish in the brine for so long with a very high amount of salt, because if we were to add too much salt to the brine and leave the fish in there too long, you would have a completely inedible product. It would be way too salty. So we brined our fish this morning for about three or four hours. What kind of salt do you use? That's just kosher salt. Um, it's just diamond crystal kosher salt um, from Morton's. Um, Morton's, if you want to sponsor me, hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the reason I prefer this salt um, is after working in kitchens for so long, you season with your fingers. Like it's a pinch of salt, it's just sprinkling across the fish. And as weird as it is to say, all salts have a different texture to them. And what Morton's kosher salt feels like in my fingers is completely different than diamond crystal kosher salt. So I was really excited that they have more than salt here in the kitchen because if I worked with diamond crystal kosher salt, I worked with that in my younger years when I was in my early 20s. That was the salt that we worked with and I got a really good feel for that. And then when I switched over to Morton's kosher salt, 
I was realizing things were either over-seasoned or under-seasoned, and it was completely just a different feel in your fingers and just a different sprinkling texture. So whatever salt you get used to, I just recommend you stick with that. Are um, on your stocks, when you make your own stocks, are you're not adding salt to the stock? No. So you never want to add salt to stock, because if you add salt to stock, then you can't reduce your stocks. If, does that make sense? If I reduce my stock and it has salt in it, it will just continue to get salty. So if I continue to reduce my stock, I want to be able to reduce and concentrate all those flavors without adding salt. So salt is always the last ingredient I add to any recipe other than brines. If you're making a brine or something like that, you can add all your salt in the beginning because you're trying to dissolve your salt. I'm going to show you a cool little fun trick here for how to cool this down very quickly. Um, so if you'll notice, I didn't fill the pot all the way up with water. And there's a reason for that. We'll get to it here in just a little bit. Um, but you can add salt in the beginning of this because you're going for a very specific amount of salt. If I was to add salt, salt into my soup in the very beginning, like right now, if I was to add a whole bunch of salt in there, then as that soup cooked and reduced down, I wouldn't be able to control the salt. I would have to add more stock to it and more ingredients to it to balance all those salt flavors. So get your soup all the way finished. It should be pureed. It should be cooked. The same deal with stock. You want to get it all the way finished. And then if you want to add salt, feel free to add salt. Um, I know a lot of young cooks, like, seasoning is their one number one issue, and that's the issue we have to work on with a lot of young cooks, because seasoning is so difficult. Either something is perfectly seasoned, or it's under-seasoned, or it's over-seasoned. And that perfect is just right there in the middle, and it's very difficult to get to. But once you get to it, you go, oh, that's how everything is going to be seasoned. So, we're going to let that cook for a little bit. I'm going to add our pine cones in now. Now, these tips of pine, this is where all the flavors come from right up here in these young little pine needles. Um, and I called my dad yesterday because my dad was in the U.S. Forest Service for pretty much my whole childhood, and now he's in real estate. But he played this game with us when we were kids. We'd be walking through the woods, and myself and my sister, and he would just touch a tree. And then it was our job to outpace the other one and ID the tree faster than they could. So I usually won, Kate, if you're watching. I usually won. But, um, so I was having a hard time IDing these pine trees here. Conveniently enough, they got a picture of loblolly pine in my room, and it's these, it's these, so I didn't necessarily need it, but it's always nice to have a second opinion on these things. Um, and the great thing about these is they do have that really concentration of flavor right here in these new growth pine needles, but these longer needles also, they have a really concentration of that flavor as well. It's a nice sort of lemon, lime, citrus flavor. I'm going to drop these in here now. And now, I don't want to cook this for a really long time with the pine needles and stems in there. Does anybody know why that might be? Sap? It's the tannins. We all think about tannins with red wine or tannins with wine in general. But what tannins come from is either the stems from the grapes themselves or when you're aging the wine in barrels, in oak barrels or any sort of barrels. It pulls the tannins out of the wood and it's in the wine. And that's how you get tannins in wine. The way that made sense for me whenever someone explained it to me for the first time, they said, you know when you're drinking out of a mountain stream, as everyone knows, but <laughs> so, you know when you're drinking out of a mountain stream and you get somewhat of a bitter flavor from the water that's coming out of the mountain stream, it's because a tree has fallen over somewhere back up the stream. And as the water leaches through the tree and comes down the stream, it pulls the tannins out. And you drink that mountain stream, and you're like, oh, the water tastes sort of bitter. It's the tannins from the tree. And that was what, whenever, that, whenever I heard that the first time, I was like, it just makes sense now. That's now I understand tannins in food. So the longer I cook the wood into this broth, the more tannins will come in. So we don't, we, I like bitter as a flavor. I don't think bitter is a bad flavor. I think a lot of times you hear people say, oh, it's bitter. I hate it. Like, coffee is bitter. Chocolate is bitter. A lot of things are good that are bitter. It's just bitter balance. And things that balance bitter are sugar and fat. That's why you add sugar and cream to your coffee. You're balancing the bitter flavor. So, as we do with this, we'll just balance the acidity from this. So the same way people add some like lemon to their tea to balance the bitter flavor in their tea, we're balancing with the lemon-lime flavor from the pine. And as soon as we get all the soup dropped, I'm going to let Hannah speak about the first one here in just a second. So as soon as everybody gets to stop talking and talk about wine for a little bit. So that's just going to cook. Our soup is cooking right now. A 
another thing that we do a lot at the restaurant, and we don't really get to talk about it right now because we don't have any protein that we're working, let's talk a little bit about fish. But we try as much as we possibly can to work with whole animals. And because for me, when I talk about sustainable food, nothing can be more sustainable than a whole animal. So if I'm buying chicken, I'm buying whole chickens. I never buy chicken breast, I never buy chicken legs. If you're buying beef, I'm buying a whole cow. Like, so if you've ever seen a whole cow, it is a doozy of an animal. It's big. But, and the reason for that, I always make the example. If we were to go to a steakhouse, pick any steakhouse you want to think about, I don't want to say any names, but we all think about big steakhouses or bad restaurants like you guys are in so yeah. But, um, so they always have an eight ounce fillet on the menu. Guaranteed, you go to any restaurant, there's an eight ounce beef fillet. So the problem with that is there is only about 20 to 22 eight ounce fillets on one pack. So let's say conservatively that they sell maybe 40, let's say, yeah, conservative estimates. They sell 40 tenderloin fillets on a busy night. So that's two gaps. Let's multiply that out by the number of restaurants in the country, multiply that out by the number of restaurants in the world, multiply that out by the number of days that are open. It's very easy to see why we have these confinement feedlots. It's easy to see why we have these overcrowding of farms. It's easy for me to understand because we've created a system in which there's a need for that, there's a need for that in the animal. So it's easy to see why we have these problems with confinement feedlots everywhere. So that's been a real big issue. And as we work with whole animals, as opposed to a restaurant like that that will go through hundreds and hundreds of cows a year, for us, we go through two to three cows a year. So and we work with one very specific farm. It's all grass-fed animals. And when you come into the restaurant, some weeks there will be ribeye on the menu. Some weeks there will be filet on the menu. Some weeks there will be sirloin on the menu. Some weeks there will be cheek. Some weeks there will be tongue. It's just everything that actually comes with an animal. And for me, it's really important for people to understand there isn't just one cut on the cow. There's not just ribeye steaks on the cow. There's everything on the cow. And we need to learn that all those things can be delicious if properly prepared. And that's really the big issue is that they need to be properly prepared. So the soup you're having is the soup that we're making right now. And we've just garnished it with a little bit of reduced cream. That comes from Homeland Dairy. They're a local dairy producer here in North Carolina. I think their cream is some of the absolute best possible cream you can get. Um, it reminds me of the cream that my grandmother talks about whenever, I, whenever she was a kid that had that full fat, that full flavor to it. Um, there's also some ramp croutons in there and some sumac. So sumac is probably something that you see growing on the roadsides, everybody's familiar with it. It has these little red flowers that come on in the late summer and stay until the fall. They are very sour. They actually have citric acid. And do you have that one place down there that Dan always helps? Okay, beautiful. I will come back and we'll talk about sumac here in just a second. I'm going to make Hannah talk about one really quickly. So, take it away. Another exciting note about this is, as I mentioned, or as Daniel mentioned as well, we like to 
second course that you'd be having today, and hopefully when that comes out, I don't want to talk about it all, but it's the golden cowfish that we talked about with our pine needle brine. So golden cowfish to get incredibly sustainable fish. And whenever we talk about the flavors that go with the fish, the idea is how do we balance all those flavors and how do we make that dish a full body dish. So we wanted to add something. The fish can be very acidic, the fish can be very mild. We wanted to add something sort of fatty to it. Yukon gold potato puree works really well. It gives us this you know, nice mouthfeel that we're looking for there. And then I wanted to give you sort of a wow ingredient on the dish. And the wow ingredient for me is fiddlehead burgers. So has anybody had fiddlehead burgers before? Awesome. Like, they sort of look like that though. But it's the beginning stage of a growth on fern. So we've all seen ferns. Um, we've got a lot of them growing here on the ground. And all ferns start out as fiddlehead. So they start very little curled up. And then as the fern grows, it unfurls and turns into the actual fern. So every single fern is a fiddlehead. But the ones we're working with today are these ostrich fiddlehead ferns, which to me are some of the absolute best. They're some of the mildest tasting. They don't have the bitter flavor that you mostly associate with fiddlehead ferns. It's just really clean flavor. It kind of tastes like a cherry. So we roasted this off with just a little bit of chili and garlic, kind of a continuation of flavor from the chili in the brine to the chili in the fiddlehead to all the sauces for the fish. So the sauce for the fish is a pine needle beurre blanc. So I know we've all seen beurre blanc on menus before, and it's mostly a lemon beurre blanc. So when I think of lemon beurre blanc, I think of, all right, lemon beurre blanc, that's cool. I get the flavor. I understand it. But to me, it's kind of boring. I've seen it in a lot of restaurants over the years. It is what it is. It's a sauce, and it's an acidic sauce for a fish. So when I started thinking about how I wanted to do the food for this lunch and for the dinner tonight, I was like, I want to do something, and I want to give them flavors that are recognized, and I want to give them techniques that are recognized, but I want to do it in a way that is different and shows them some new ingredients that they might not have thought about, and show them some new techniques they might not have thought about. So when I was making the verb blanc, the process for a verb blanc is very simple. You take white wine and some sort of stock, whether it's vegetable, in this case it was fish. We took fish stock, the white wine, the shallots, and the garlic, and we started reducing that down. And as that got down to the end, I added a pine needle set to it because I didn't want to impart their bitter flavor. So I lines sort of fresh flavor. So I chopped them up, added them in, let them cook into it, and then we pulled it off the stove and we added butter to it. And while it's off the stove, we started adding the butter because you add the butter when it's on the heat, the butter will cook too quickly and the sauce will break. <laughs> so what we got is a really nice emulsified sauce because the butter is added very slowly. It emulsifies the sauce. It pulls everything together. The most famous emulsified sauce we all probably know is a mayonnaise. Like mayonnaise and emulsified sauce. You've got a stabilizer and an egg yolk, and you've got fat in the form of canola oil or any sort of blended oil. Um, but when we're talking about this, the stabilizer for this is the room temperature liquid. So you get this really reduced concentrated liquid. And as I add butter to that, which is the fat, it emulsifies into the liquid because you've got the collagen in there from the fish, and you've got all that protein that's holding the stuff, holding the sauce together. So I think the fish dish will be really nice, and then you'll know how to make it. Too. So, um, so we're going to go ahead and strain this brine off. And the trick that I was talking about is I never add as much water as I think I'm going to need for the entire brine. I save some of that in the form of ice. So I'm going to go ahead and taste this right now. Make sure my salt is at the level I want it to be. Tastes like Christmas. Like, um, so it's incredibly salty at this point. And that was the point, because I'm not going to be able to add salt when it comes back to room temperature, because the salt is dissolved. So I want it to be very, very salty at this point. Add ice. Still throw your ice. And then we'll strain this brine off. I love the color on this. I mean, it comes from the chilies and it comes from the pine. But isn't that just the prettiest thing? Like, it's sort of that golden color. It goes really well with the fish. Like, you'll notice that the fish, you get this nice sort of golden brown color on there, and that comes from the searing, but also from the inherent sugars that are in the pine. So, in most brines, you would add some sugar to them, um, because it's the same idea, osmosis, pulls the, pulls the liquid into the fish or into the protein, whatever you're looking for, but we have so much inherent sugar in the pine cones and the vitamin C already, that we don't need to add sugar to our brine. We can just add salt. Exactly. So I could use this right now, as opposed to 
a lot of brine recipes, you'll say, oh, I'll make your brine, refrigerate it overnight, and then you can use it the next day. I want to use my brine right now. Like, I want to make it and be able to utilize it. So if we just use as much liquid as we need to dissolve the salt and get the ingredients, and then you can use that liquid to, heat it, to cool down or to heat up your ice and get that back to room temperature. All right, awesome. So again, it's still very salty at this point, but it's supposed to be. It's a brine. It's not so much a stock or it's not so much a marinade. It's supposed to work through osmosis to pull that liquid into the fish. And that is how you typically put the brine in the brine pond? I would. Um, now the problem. Exactly. We're just trying to dissolve the salt and we don't want to pull out all those flavors. And again, I encourage you've got a lot of spoons up here. I'm going to put all the things that I want you to taste, I'm going to put them over here. <laughs> and so if you feel free, come up after this is over. You can taste the wood swirl, you can taste the brine. Because I think it's one of those things, like I talk about this all the time with young cooks, that I really think you need to taste products. If you can taste the product and you can understand the product fully, then that's how you know you can utilize it in the future. So once you taste that brine, you're like, oh, that's the salt content that I'm going for. And I hope you'll notice it is very salty. Like, it is a salty product. So, we were talking about sumac earlier. Um, so sumac, you see it on the roadsides. Um, and it actually has citric acid and malic acid that grows on the plant itself. If you wait for it to come into the late summer and early fall, you can actually see the acid on the outside of the flower. You can just wipe it off. It's the coolest thing in the world. It almost looks like there was snow on the outside. Um, so we just take the sumac, we let it dry, we dry it all over the restaurant. Like if you come into my restaurant, you'll notice I have various projects going all over the restaurant. Um, but it's fine, I can do what I want. <laughs> so, um, We've got egg yolk salt drying in the front corner. We've got tobacco drying in the front behind the host stand. We've got sumac drying in here. We've got herbs hanging everywhere and drying. We've got vinegar that we're making. They're just scattered all throughout the restaurant. So it's a it's a definitely a labor of love. Um, but the sumac is drying up behind the stand. And as soon as it's dry, we just powder that up. And then I can use that to garnish different soups. We can use it to make brines. We can use it to um, season sauces or season soups. Um, we've done crust before, like we've just taken fish dredged it in the sumac powder and seared it off, and you get that nice sort of citrusy coating on the outside of the fish with that nice crunch, as well as that sumac flavor. So sumac is a very, very versatile ingredient. The other ingredient in your soup was ramp croutons. So whenever we work with ramps, we try to utilize them for the most of their potential, because we talked about the sustainability issue earlier with ramps. So as we get ramps, we'll take them and we'll let one get a little bit to go a long way. So, if I've got a little bit of ramp, I can take them, I can add them to olive oil, puree them up, and then instead of having to use three or four pounds of ramps to season all the croutons, I can get three or four ramps, so three or four ramps each, puree those up, and then make an oil, toss my croutons in, and then bake off the croutons. So I get the continuation of flavor, I get a lot of flavor all the way throughout them, but without utilizing all of the product. So it's a really fun little technique there. Season delivery in the fish right now, so I'm going to start pureeing up this soup so you can see how this process works. And like I said, this could get messy. Hopefully, it will not. But I'm making a label. I'll make some. I think what works really well whenever you're pureeing a soup, we'll make sure these guys stay there, cool, um, is to add a lot of your vegetable products or your meat products, whatever it is that you're going to be pureeing, in first, and then add the liquid to that so that you can get an even puree on everything. Whereas if I just pour this in there and got sort of a mix of vegetable and liquid, like it might not get the same consistency. I want. It might, it might work out really well, but in this way, I'm completely assured <laughs> that my soup's going to have the consistency I want. See all the vegetables are cooked through right now, they're very tender. And the garnish on the fish dish that you've got is a garnet mustard. And that comes from one of my favorite farms here in North Carolina, is Fair Share Farm, and it's Elliot and his wife Emma. They do some of the coolest stuff I have seen in the world. Um, 
the green zone there were growing less than two minutes ago. Like, I can guarantee you that because I left specific instructions for them to be cut and then go on the blade. So, for me, green, well, not for me, it's just a known fact, but greens lose their vitamin content and lose their mineral content from the second day of harvesting. And it's not really an issue for most of our greens, like our spinach that we see in the grocery store, or our arugula, or our mustard, or anything that we see in the grocery store. It's sort of lost a little bit of flavor, and it's lost a little bit of its nutritional content. But for this, when we're trying to make a very specific dinner, and we want to really show off what the product is, I want you to get every single bit of flavor from those ingredients. So that garnet mustard, like I was saying, it was growing, like, if you're doing your place right now, it was growing 30 seconds ago. So it's very, very cool. And they sell them to us in these living trays. So we get a whole tray of greens that are just growing. Um, and we get a whole bunch of different things. There's mustard, there's sophomores, there's a lot of different things that Elliot and Emma grow. And I think, to me, they do some of the coolest ingredients in the whole Southeast. So Now I'm gonna pour this liquid in here. And I'm not going to fill it all the way up, and that's for several reasons. Um, one, I don't want to make a mess. Um, and two, if you add all of it in here, I'm going to be left with just a very little bit of soup. If I was to fill this thing up completely, um, then I would be left with just a very little bit of soup, and there's no reason to puree one huge batch and one very small batch. Puree two medium-sized batches, and they control your consistency, and you control the flavors of the soup. So, I'm going to bring this up here. I don't know if anybody's got a body prep at home, but these are coolest. Like, and they will puree everything. Like, we use this to make powders at the restaurant. We use this to make foams. Um, they're just an incredibly versatile product. So the trick with a body prep or with any blender, and I'm going to turn this around so we can all see it right here. <coughs> so you want to start on low. This is on one right here. And I want to have my high down on variable as opposed to high. Now the issue right here is if this was on high, or if a cook had been in here before I had, and turned that all the way up to high, which is often the case, I'm gonna turn it up to high as we puree this right now. But at the end, always turn it back down to low, because the next person will come in, they'll flip it on, it'll be on high, and soup will hit the seat. Like, it happens all the time. <laughs> and it's really great when it happens with beets. <laughs> yeah, that's not the voice of experience at all. So, we're gonna turn this right now. Very low, and you see it starts to blend. And then we're gonna gradually raise. soy lecithin, which is basically just a soy-derived protein, um, and that's what most professional chefs would use to make foams. You can add a tablespoon of soy lecithin to this, the whole thing would turn into foams, and then you can put the foam in a lot of different places and wait to fall. So, I'm going to put this in a veg stock container, just so we can combine it all. Never quite sure how these things are going to come out. That came out really well. I'm excited. <laughs> and we're going to get the rest of our soup in here. every single bit of product out of this pot because we're going to go back into this pot whenever the soup is finished. Beautiful. Right. And so, 
I would encourage everybody, I don't know if you're really getting the main message of this, the main message of this demo is eat your yard. <laughs> eat your yard. Like, eat the weeds, eat, 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 eat everything. I saw a commercial the other day, I was watching TV, and it was for Scott's Turk or something, I think, and it was like, do you have a problem with dollar weeds? Do you have a problem with first lane? No, I don't. I love to eat them. Like, I don't have that issue. Like, so I want to make a counter commercial for Scott's. That's like, do you, oh, yes, you can eat dollar weed. Yeah. Um, dollar weed is fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah, I buy it for, uh, when I'm buying it, I buy it for $5 a pound. So, like, I think if you've got restaurants in your area that would use local ingredients, like, harvest it, take it to them, it works fantastic as a gin and tonic. Like, the dollar, dollar weed just muddled in when you're making a gin and tonic. Oh, my God, there's nothing better. Like, there really isn't. Like, it has these nice herbaceous floral notes to it. Um, I got my parents turned on to it now, and that's the only way they drink gin and tonic. So, then I'll have to source dollar weed for So, again, super low, you saw me at present, not back down. I'm big on that because I've done that before. So, 
We have very little waste in our restaurant. I hate to waste product because for me, when you're wasting product, one, you're going away money, which is never fun, but then also, you're wasting a farmer's time. And that's what it comes down to more for me. I buy food, food from a lot of my friends, I buy food from farmers that I have a lot of respect for, and all my folks know, nothing will get me more frustrated and more angry quicker than them throwing away or wasting a product that came from one of our farmers that we work with. Because to me, it's not so much about having respect for the food, everything like that, but it's the respect that goes along with the farmer that took them six months, a year, to put this product together. So I say, whenever things come into the restaurant, they've been working on them for three months, six months, a year in some cases with the animals that we're working with. And we get it in that last 24 to 48 hours, and it's our job not to screw it up. Because we can burn something, we can over-season something, and all those months and months of work are just going right down the drain because we made a careless mistake with our food. So I think I hope that comes through in a lot of food that we're working with today because for us, we really want to pay a lot of attention. We want to have a lot of respect for our, for our farmers to put this stuff, to put this food together. So, yeah. so you can repropagate ramps. So what they do is they just transplant them, but it has to be in the climate that works for them. So you see them growing, like most of the time they're growing, I think it's 3,500, 4,000 feet and above. They have to grow in that elevation. Um, but I say that, I transplanted one ramp to my grandmother's backyard um, just for fun. Like I wanted to see what would happen. And now there's four of them. So they double every year. So that was two years ago, and now we have four. So I don't know if there's a lot of stop the elevation thing, but it definitely has to have the right temperature, and it has to have the right soil. Um, you see them growing with a lot of oak trees. You see them growing with a lot of tulip poplar trees. Um, and you see them growing in very rich and lowly soil. And get this soup back up to a boil now and adjust our seasoning. The fish right here, three hours or so. Yeah. And now we're going to taste this. We're going to taste this. So, definitely salt. There's been no salt added anywhere throughout this process. As opposed to when I was making the brine, I pour the salt in my hand and then I season it out of my hand. There are so many mistakes that happen where you do this and you get way more salt than you need. So we put all this work into it at this point. We don't want to mess up our seasoning right here at the end. A few pinches of it in there. So you can always add more. It's really hard to take it out. <laughs> But in North Carolina right now with the mushroom, the mu is mushroom issue is we can't buy any mushrooms that don't come from an NTA or USDA inspected facility. So we've been trying to get that law changed, and I'd say in the next two months, I keep saying the next month, but I'll say the next two months, that we should have that law changed. That before the time South, before the time Chantrells come this season, we should be able to forage mushrooms and have a tag system in place and have them come into the restaurant so we can properly utilize them. Because the problem right now is all restaurants and all food service establishments are governed by this thing called the food code. And they update the food code every four years. So right now, North Carolina is functioning on the 2009 food code. There is a 2013 food code, which is what South Carolina operates under. And that was how South Carolina was able to get in and have these foragers licensed. Because in the 2009 food code, it applies for something and it says, if there is a verified mushroom expert, then that person can forage mushrooms and sell them to the food service establishment. In South Carolina, they actually define what a mushroom expert is. And it's a person who's taken crab class or a comparable class and can demonstrate knowledge of the subject. In North Carolina, so the, what's that? All head cheese. Yeah, head cheese. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, those are different because head cheese, liver mush, pâtés, those are all fresh charcuterie. What we were just talking about right there is dry charcuterie. So fresh charcuterie, seven day shelf life, you can use it very quickly, easy, eat it, fun, good stuff. Um, dry aged charcuterie, which is what we're talking about, pepperoni, prosciutto, all those different things, never have heat added to them. So we can think about what the problems might be of that. Bacteria is killed by heat, loss of oxygen, fat content, food, acid, time, temperature, oxygen, moisture. So those are all the things that in, either inhibit bacteria growth or allow bacteria to grow. So it's fun stuff there. 
And all you're doing with charcuterie is you're aging something, you're using salt to reduce the moisture in the environment, so bacteria can't grow if there's no moisture for it to grow in. So the issue then is, if you have a charcuterie that hasn't aged long enough, and it hasn't pulled all the moisture out of it. We're aging a prosciutto at the restaurant right now, we're aging two country hams at the restaurant right now. The country hams have been going for 14 months, the prosciutto's been going for 16 months, the prosciutto will go for two years, the country hams will go for 18 months. It's not a quick thing. But, so all it is is it's taking that salt and it's pulling all the moisture out of the ham. And so once all the moisture is out of it, you can't have any room for bacteria growth. But if I was a novice bulker, I was a novice chef, and I was like, oh, I'm going to make a prosciutto, and I'm 12 months in, I'm going to be ready to go, and I'll cut that prosciutto, and I'll slice it. And we've heard horror stories of a chef um, in the Piedmont region that was slicing prosciutto, and it was still bleeding. And yes, it was under 80, and that's how people get sick. What um, Exactly. You're just reducing the you're reducing the moisture. That's really all you're doing at the end of the day. And you're trying to get the pH to a certain level. Like meat has an inherent pH point. And you're trying to get the meat below, I think it's 4.2. Common guys are watching, correct me. Um, so there's 4.2, and then once it's below that point, you don't have to worry about bacteria growing. Right and then what we do with all of our charcuterie just to be safe is we freeze everything at the end of the process for five days. Five days under freezing temperatures will kill us here. And listeria is the main thing that you're worried about. You're also worried about E. coli, but at a certain time, we're not worried about E. coli because the moisture environment is so, there's so little moisture that we don't have to worry about E. coli. But if we never raise that temperature above the temperature that kills bacteria, which is uh, for chicken, it's 165 degrees. For beef, it's 145, 155 degrees. So charcuterie never gets above that point. So if it never gets above that point, very hard for it, very hard for you to kill the bacteria. So that's how people get sick with charcuterie. <laughs> Ken, did you talk enough about this one? Did you want to talk about the one that they have with the fish? Or did they get that already? Cool, awesome. So the next dish that we're going to be doing for you, and the dish that we're going to close out today with, is my grandmother's angel food. So both my grandmothers are huge influences on my cuisine and what I think of myself as a chef. Um, so my mother's mom, she makes fantastic cornbread, fantastic biscuits, just does the best chicken you can possibly imagine. And so we'll, we'll do her biscuits for another event. But my grandmother Tuck, which is my dad's mother, does this angel food cake. And to me, I think it's one of the best things that I've eaten all year. So um, we just have that angel food cake, and then very simple, some fresh strawberries on there that have been macerated with just a little bit of sugar to pull that moisture out of them and get sort of a strawberry syrup. Then there's some fresh cream on there, the same homeland dairy cream. We just whipped that up a little bit ago. And then the piece de resistance to the whole thing is the honey. Um, anybody that knows about my restaurant knows that I'm an avid beekeeper. Um, we have eight hives of honeybees on the roof of the restaurant right now, and I'm up there about once a week taking care of the bees. Uh, we've got some really fun pictures on our website where we're up there and like no bee suits and playing with the bees. Like, there, it's one of those things. People are so scared of bees, um, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, probably for this thing, but um, the honeybee situation is it's in dire straits right now. Um, if we want to talk about what our grocery stores would look like without honeybees, take about 70 or 80% of the grocery store away. Um, I heard the best quote on grocery stores the other day. Grocery stores are the illusion of abundance. Because you walk into a grocery store and there's everything there. Like, you can get tomatoes in January, you can get asparagus 365 days out of the year. It's the illusion of abundance. But if we keep going with where we're going with the honeybees, that illusion is going to be very quickly dissipated because honeybees are an incredible pollinator. They pollinate a large, a large percentage of what we have. Like they pollinate corn, they pollinate wheat, they pollinate any sort of fruit trees, any sort of nut trees you can think about. So the reason for us having honeybees on the restaurant roof isn't so much to keep honey. Like we maybe get eight gallons or so of honey a year out of those hives, which again is a lot of honey, but we let them keep an entire super for themselves, and a super is what they store their honey in. So you put a super on top, the bees fill it with honey, and then the first super is theirs, and then anything they fill after that, we take. So their first super will get them through the winter. 
So we never have to feed our bees. You hear a lot of people feed their bees with corn syrup, they feed their bees with sugar water, um, pretty nasty stuff. Um, to feed these animals that produce honey year round, they produce honey because that's what they're going to feed on in the winter. Because in the winter they're not foraging on nectar, they're not foraging on pollen, so they don't have anything to feed themselves. Um, bees eat two things. They eat pollen, which is their protein source, and they eat nectar, which they turn into honey, which is their sugar source. They have a protein and a sugar source, that's their complete diet. Bees can forage in a three mile radius from their hive. So if you see a hive of honeybees, they can forage anywhere within three miles of there, which is a very scary thing for us because I can't control something that's two and a half miles away. If somebody wants to spray a neonicotinoid, which that's a mouthful right there, but yeah. that is what is killing honeybees. Neonicotinoids, and we can spell it all out, but it's, it's a pesticide that's being produced by Bayer and Monsanto and Syngenta. So those three companies produce it. It's outlawed everywhere in Europe. It's outlawed everywhere in Australia. And for some reason, we think it's necessary for us to have it here in America. So that's what's killing the honeybee population. We can put it on a lot of different things. It's called colony collapse disorder, which is what's killing the honeybees. But there's a lot of things that contribute to colony collapse disorder. So it's trucking honeybees from North Carolina to California, moving them all around, feeding them corn syrup, feeding them sugar water. Like, there's a lot of things that contribute to it, but the one thing we can point to and say that for sure is killing honeybees is neonicotinoids. And it's a nicotine-based pesticide. And what it does, like, there's a lot of documentaries you can watch on it, or if you just want to come watch the honeybees, like, we've lost, last winter we lost four hives. Like, now we've got really healthy hives of honeybees, so we had swarms this spring, we swarmed back up to full population. But at the end of the day, like we don't want to just have this continuing cycle of losing five hives, swarming five hives, losing five hives, swarming five hives. It just doesn't make any sense. So the issue with the is it's a nicotine-based pesticide. The honeybees get on a flower where it's been sprayed with the pesticide, they ingest the neonicotinoids, and then it just scrambles their brain and they can't find their way back to the hive. So they fly around, they look like a person that just took, ingested a whole bunch of nicotine, so they're bouncing from flower to flower to flower to flower to flower, and then they just die. And they don't know their way back to the hive. It's a really, really sad thing. So you'll see a queen from a colony that's collapsed. You'll see one queen in the hive with no bees left. And it's the saddest thing you can possibly imagine. Because I think of my bees like my pets. Like they're basically, they're basically like my dogs. Like I go up there, I talk to them, they know me. And like I, I, we joke about that, but like they know your smell. And if I go up there after I've worked a shift and I smell like I've worked in the kitchen, they'll let me know. They'll start buzzing around my face. Like, oh, we don't like you, you don't smell really nice right now. They like you to have a shower, they like you to smell nice. Like it's a, it makes sense because they forage on flowers, they really like nice smelling things. So they like their people to smell nice as well. But they know your smell and Bees only have a three week life cycle. So in some way, it's a colony, it's a hive mentality that they somehow communicate through the honeycomb and the queen lets all of them know that even after they've died in three weeks, oh, that's Clark, he's coming back, that's Clark, he knows us. And it's just an amazing thing. Like They're an absolutely amazing creature. So that's some of our rooftop honey on the angel food cake. Um, I'm gonna open it up now for a few questions. So if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask, before I start cleaning up and getting back to the kitchen and let you enjoy the rest of your lunch. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask Kitten. Um, I varieties of sumac. Well, there's like four different varieties of sumac that we have in North Carolina. There's staghorn sumac, there's standard sumac, and then there's, uh, what's it called? It's called marsh sumac, I believe. Um, if you're foraging in a marsh, I wouldn't recommend foraging sumac because the only poison sumac grows in marshes. If you're on a roadside, if you're in a dry, relatively dry area, you can forage sumac with no problem. Um, and I heard that same thing when I was a kid. Like, we always joke, a couple of my farmers and chef friends, like, we always say, if my parents didn't know what it was, it was poisonous. Like, it was just poisonous, like, poisonous, don't touch it. Like, and sumac was one of those things. I always thought as a kid that all sumac was poisonous. So as soon as you broke a sumac branch, like, everybody was terrified, everybody run away from it. But now, now I'm out there picking the flowers and, like, reutilizing them. Um, you hear a lot of the, probably a pretty racist thing to say, but the Indian pink lemonade. 
um, they used to just take sumac and boil it in water, and it would turn into pink, and it would be really acidulated, and that was their sort of pink lemonade. Um, you see a lot of um, we have a farmer that produces a shrub that he calls Cherokee lemonade, and it has sumac in it. Of course. So how do you find the, um, the morale? I forged 70 pounds of morels this year. Oh my God. I found eight. I, in previous years, I would have said, yeah, like I was, last year we found like 20. Um, but this year, I've got a guy, his name is Reed Pat, I've got, he's named Reed Patterson, and he took me out for the first time this year, and he's a magician. I don't know how he does it, but he knows where mushrooms grow and how they grow. And, and I, if you find good size, good size morels, one that was eight ounces this year. It was as big as my head. Yeah. Like, <laughs> have you ever seen a mulberry yellow ball mushroom? We have a little bit of a property. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, sure. It's like, almost like a, a sort of ball mushroom. Some mushrooms that can easily be ID. So, my, yeah. 
I do puff balls. Yeah. Puff balls are good, but you have to make sure when you cut them that they're white on the inside, not black. Like if they're black on the inside, they're past their, past their prime and not so great. Um, but yes, my email's on the website. We've got a blog on the website. Um, I've written a few different blogs, basically about things that interest me. I wrote about suicide in the culinary industry because that's a really hot button issue right now. I don't know if anybody's familiar. If you have a chef in your family or someone that you know is a chef, this is an incredibly difficult endeavor. So we're going to have the time time her team come out here a little bit. Chef Thierry, the team, they're going to come out, right? I think. Is Chef Thierry going to come out and say hello to everybody? We'll get them. Okay, I think so, yeah. So please give them a huge round of applause when they come out. Like, I can only speak from my personal experience, but whenever we talk about this industry, 70, 80, 90 hour work weeks, those are the norm. Um, not having time with your family, not having time with your friends, being incredibly driven by the food. These are all things that I think about sometimes in a positive light, but it can easily go the other way. Um, and it's, easily, it's easy to get into a depression in this industry. It's easy to take all the online reviews too seriously. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've read my Yelp reviews and almost wanted to cry. People are very mean. I, think, I don't think they understand that. There's people behind these endeavors. Like, it's, it's a real person. And so when you say something about a restaurant, it's not this corporate head poncho that's sitting up here counting cash. It's, it's me in my house, like, <laughs> sitting right around the corner. So I think it's really, really important that we understand this is a difficult industry to work in. And I know we've all gone out to restaurants and had bad experiences before. I will tell you, if you've got constructive criticism in my restaurant, like if you said, this fish is overcooked, it's over seasoned, I don't like it, those are things that I want to hear. I want to hear them while you're in the restaurant. I want to make it right while you're in the restaurant. I don't want you to have to pay for a product that you didn't enjoy. I don't want you to have to pay for a dish you didn't enjoy. Like if someone's had a bad experience in my restaurant, it's not at all uncommon for me just to take the bill and be done. Like you didn't have a great experience, you didn't have the experience I wanted you to have in my restaurant, I don't expect you to pay for that. I want you to pay for the experience that I intended for you to have when you come into the restaurant. And so we want to make everything as perfect as we possibly can. But it's an incredibly difficult industry to work in. Hopefully the Finders team will make it out here in a little bit. Chef Morgan, who's the chef here. Yeah, Morgan Wesley. It's like two first names. So Morgan Wesley, who's the, who's the chef de cuisine here, has been an absolute fireball. Like he's so passionate about foraging. He was out foraging with us this morning. Like he foraged chicken in the woods and hen in the woods for the resort here. Just absolute dynamic chef. Um, chef Kevin, who's the AM sous chef here, who's been handling everything that I've been doing today. Chef Thierry, who's the executive chef of the whole property. They've got just, and there's so many young cooks back there who are just so passionate about everything. I can't tell you, like, if you've got me here outside of what we've just done today, like, I'm sure you can taste the quality of the food because they're so passionate back there in the kitchen and it comes through in the food. I really believe you can taste passion in the food because chefs that are so passionate about it, you can taste the seasoning. You can taste the love that goes into the food. There's, there's a lot of good love that goes on in that kitchen back there. Um, so I can't say enough good things about the team. And I mean, the service team too. Like, please, like, give your servers a big round of applause. I don't know if anybody knows how difficult it is. <laughs> Anytime you're cooking for more than four or five people, there is some crazy logistics <laughs> that go into making sure all the food comes out hot. Come, Jeff Thierry, <laughs> yes, man. I was just telling them just how what a hard industry this is, what a hard industry it is to work in, like how hard you guys have worked all day today. Like it's been a real pleasure to work with you guys, and I just want to show you guys too. So, so you, you know, I came very prepared. So we That's not true. <laughs> Questions, but I'm gonna get cleaned up. We'll be, I'll be up here just cleaning everything up. So if you have any questions that you're too embarrassed to ask in a group, my servers at the restaurant can relate to that. They all ask me questions. Chef, I just want to know this real quick. Like, yes. So if you'd like to come up and ask questions, I'm just gonna be cleaning up here. So please. Now, wait, Hannah's gonna chat a little bit more about the wine. So yes, the dessert wine. Yeah. So I'll be cleaning. So please enjoy the rest of your wine. Thank you. and then the 
other half we kept chilled. And after we stopped the fermentation, we blended the natural juices back in, so it's more of a natural sweetened wine. Then that left us with having to put less residual sugar back into it. So you're going to notice more of that passion fruit, um, like agave and honeysuckle, uh, pear, things of that nature. Um, the one thing that I appreciate about this is I'm more of a dry wine drinker, but a sweet wine is paired excellent with a dessert, as you had this evening. Um, and Whenever I have that, I want something that's going to pair up equally with it. It's not going to be overpoweringly sweet. Um, if you're more of a dry wine drinker and you have some sweet wines, I'm sure you've had a few of those sweet wines that, like, it leaves a film in your mouth. And almost, I know this sounds a little silly, but it makes you want to brush your teeth halfway through the glass <laughs> because it's, like, sticky and feels yucky. Um, I personally do not get that with the Happy Endings. It has a nice minerality but yet acidity to it that gives it that nice balance and crisp, clean feeling to it. And so I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did with the last course that we had. Um, and I hope you enjoyed our wines that you tried this evening. As Danny mentioned earlier, I do encourage you if you get a chance to come up and visit us at Jolo. It's a beautiful establishment, definitely <coughs> worth the drive. I mean, beautiful country back roads getting there. And then we also have a honeymoon cottage. I know you don't have to be on your honeymoon to come up. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. It's a real pleasure.